pairs of footsteps echoed down the dark alley. He stopped, waited, waited for Jack the Ripper to strike. But this is not London in 1888. No, this is Chicago in 1945. Yet Jack the Ripper is loose again to knife, to butcher his victims without trace. Hello, creeps. This is Peter Lorre opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. If you recall some 60 years ago, London was terrorized by a one-man crime wave, by a murderer who was never captured and never seen. And tonight, we follow the investigations of Sir Guy Hollis, who firmly believes that Jack the Ripper is still alive, that it is he who is the fiend that once again slashes and kills. There is the element of the supernatural in this story that will amaze you. For it seems that the spirit world has given the black heart of Jack the Ripper the power of everlasting life. Time, the present. Our scene is the reception room of a well-known Chicago psychiatrist, Dr. John Comedy. Miss Canister, the doctor's assistant, is chatting with a tall, distinguished man who is apparently waiting to consult Dr. Comedy. But surely, Sir Guy, you can't believe a theory that seems so, well, uh, astrological. I'm afraid I do, Miss Canister. I do, uh, Grant, Miss Canister, that we still know very little about the life energy of the sun, about those forces which keep the planets in their spheres and keep a star from spinning astray and crashing into the regular building. Hello there. Oh, Dr. Comedy. I'll be with you in a moment, Mr. Hollis. Uh, Miss Canister, will you step into my office, please? Uh, take your time, Doctor. Anything to gain your patient's respect. Well, what have I done now? It's Sir Guy Hollis. Oh. He's a lord or a knight or anyway, not a commoner. Attached to the British consulate here. Did you find out anything else about him? Nothing about his mental condition. He's right out of an English movie. Mm. Only thing that's missing is a monocle. Oh, yes, and he's a bug about astrology. Mm. Send him in, hmm? Mm-hmm. Doctor, will see you now, Thank you. It's been a somewhat busy day, Sir Guy. Sorry you had to wait so long. Well, an apology a doctor need never make, sir. Most attractive office, Doctor. That's also my home. Oh, that explains the piano, then, and the painting. Oh, perhaps. Uh -huh. What do you think of London, Doctor? London? Why? Have you ever noticed anything strange about it? <laughs> The fog is famous, although here in Chicago we sometimes have one to match it. Yes, the fog. That's important. It always provides the perfect setting. For what? For murder. murder. Tell me, Sir Guy, what is a Londoner doing in Chicago discussing murder with a psychiatrist? Have you ever heard of Jack the Ripper, Doctor? The murderer? The greatest monster of them all. Worse than Spring Hill Jack or Crippen, even. Red Jack. Red Jack the Ripper. Yes, I've heard of him. Do you know his history, Doctor? See here, Sir Guy. Doctors are pretty much in demand these days. I assumed you were a patient wanted my help as a psychiatrist. If you just wanted to swap old wives' tales about famous crimes, perhaps we might arrange dinner This is no old wives' tale, Doctor. This is a matter of life and death. Sorry. What is? But well, listen. London, 1888. Out of nowhere, a shadowy figure with a knife haunting the squalid dives of... Whitechapel and Spitalfield. Six times that night descended into the throats and bodies of London's women. Thirty-nine stab wounds, the paper said the first time. August 31st, another victim. On September 8th, watchmen making their rounds in the grey dawn stumbled across the third hacked and horrid thing. Oh, I understand he used his knife rather well. He was an expert doctor. And where did he learn? At the operating table? The butcher's block? Some said on the police force. On November 9th, a sixth victim was found on the floor of her room. Panic in the grandstand? Yes, but needless panic. Months passed, a year. They said Jack had escaped to America. They said he committed suicide. 
They've been saying things ever since. You tell the story very well, but I'm afraid that's all the time I can give you today, Sir Guy. I haven't any. I'm anxious to hear the rest of your Dr. story. Dr. Carmine, I... I am on the trail of Jack the Ripper. I've tracked him here to Chicago. You've tracked See here, Sir Guy. Oh, what was the date of those London murders? 1888. Oh, look, if Jack the Ripper were even born that year, he'd be, uh, he'd be 56 today. I'd say Red Jack would be good and dead about now. Would he? Or should I say would she? Because the Ripper may have been a woman, you know. You think I'm insane, Doctor? No. Well, then you might listen to my reason for thinking the Ripper is still alive. I have been studying these cases for 30 years. Talked to officials, friends of the poor drabs he killed. And then I started studying unsolved murders all over the world. Followed a trail of blood. I could show you clippings from San Francisco, Shanghai, Berlin, Cairo, Milan. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven such murders. And all had the trademark of the Ripper. You remember the uh, New Orleans Sorso slayings last summer? Well, vaguely colleague of mine tended the hearings. Then surely you remember two recent ones here in Chicago. One out on South Durban in September, and then a few weeks ago there was another very much like it up on Posted. Yes. Yeah. Well, Doctor? You're the criminologist. But, but figure it out, Sir Guy. If Red Jack were, say, 30 in 1888, he'd be 86 today. And no man of 86 could have butchered up that Halstead for him. Suppose he didn't get any older. Suppose Red Jack Knew how to stay young. But people do grow old, Sir Guy. Murderers, too. Whether they're women or butchers or scientists, they grow old. What about sorcerers? Who? Necromancers, wizards, practices of black magic. Now, see here, Doctor. I have studied the dates of those 87 murders, and they have an astrological significance. Suppose Red Jack didn't murder for murder's sake alone. Suppose he wanted to make a sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice is that? It has been said that if you offer blood to the dark gods when the moon and the stars are right, they grant boons. Boons of eternal youth. I don't understand, Sir Guy. I'm not an authority on witchcraft, nor even an amateur criminologist. Why have you come to me? Because Jack the Ripper is here in Chicago, and through you, I am going to capture him. <laughs> Doctor. Good uh, morning, Callister. Well, how did his lordship turn out last night? Hmm. He's the most exciting patient we've had in months. Uh, he's not a patient, Callister, at least not yet. Shouldn't he be? No, I can't tell. He talks so convincingly. Maybe there is a shred of reality in the story. It's real enough to him, Lord knows. Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Yeah. Dr. Carmody's office. Uh, may I speak with Dr. Carmody, please? It's most urgent. Uh, one moment. His lordship again. Oh, uh-huh. Hello? It's Guy Hollis, Doctor. Oh? Any new clues turn up overnight? You're willing to go through with it? Oh, just this minute sent my nurse out for a magnifying glass and a pair I of handcuffs. I don't think that'll be necessary, Doctor. Oh, now, look here, Sir Guy. How can I possibly help you? I have good reason to believe the Ripper is among your acquaintances. What good reason? I'll tell you when I see you. I understand Lester Benton, a friend of yours who writes a column for the Sun-Herald, has invited you to a party tonight. Yes, that's right. How did you know that? I hope that you'll take me with you. Take you with me? I told you that I have plotted the astrological chart. The Ripper must make a sacrifice before this night passes. Okay. Uh, How about um, supper first? Splendid. Uh, Pick me up at about 7.30. Thanks awfully, Doctor. All right. Bye. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? That's why I wanted him to suffer first. If he proves dangerous, I'll manage to sidetrack him somehow. I hope Lester's in. Uh, I know. Hatchet murder on Polk Street. No, no murder yet, Lester. But if you don't become conscious, there may be. Oh, Oh, John. Yes, that's right. Now, look, old man. Is it okay if I bring someone to the party tonight? Oh, sure, John. Well, like a... It's a guy... From the British consulate. Well, all the better. Manpower shortage and all that. Now, listen, Les. Uh, he's... Well, he's kind of a strange duck. 
I'm not sure yet whether his head is on right. That's okay. Uh, plenty of company. See you tonight. Right. And, sir, all that remains now is for Sir Guy and I to attend the party tonight and capture the Ripper. What are you talking about? Well, Sir Guy says the Ripper will be there tonight. You're joking. I am, yes. But Sir Guy isn't. And perhaps he's right. <laughs> I still don't know who you're hoping to find at Lester's party tonight, Sir Guy. A few writers, a painter, singer, all fairly normal. How about so is the Ripper? Perfectly normal. Except on certain nights. Mm -hmm. Then he becomes an ageless, pathological monster crouching to kill. On evenings like tonight, when the stars are arranged in blazing patterns of death. But why among my friends... Because they are the kind of people the Ripper seeks out. Yes, but I warn you, Sir Guy, once these people find out what you're up to, you'd better be prepared for just about anything. I'll be ready. Look. What that you got there? See here, Sir Guy, you can't go around among my friends with a gun in your pocket. Oh. Then you keep it for me. Yeah. But be prepared to use it. Sure. Well, come on. The party should be in full swing by now. Well, Sir Guy, are you enjoying yourself? Immensely, John. Your friends are very charming. Except that one of them is Jack the Ripper, huh? Perhaps. And if I get the opportunity, I think I'll show you how we can find out. Well, soon, I hope. It's one o'clock. I should be leaving. Leaving? Leaving? Who said leaving? Are you trying to slow my party, John? Oh, Lester, it is late. Don't I'm be re- a killjoy, John. I've hardly met our honored guest. Oh, dear. I... Are you here on a military mission, Sir Guy? Uh, not exactly. Well, then, if it's not secret, is it? Oh, not at all, Mr. Benton. I'm on the trail of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper. Well, it's rude of us to be so curious. <laughs> Sir Guy has an idea that Jack the Ripper is prowling around Chicago, Les, and he's out to find him. Oh, really? Uh, Sir Guy is serious. Well, he should be. According to some old files I've read, Red Jack was something of a menace. Had some uh, ripping good times. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Les, your puns get worse daily. Oh, well, they're not Sir bad. Guy is sure that the Ripper is responsible for the South Dearborn murders. Oh, yeah, and the one up on Halstead a few weeks ago. Uh, you've covered them, Les. What's your idea? be. Very neat carving on both of them. But the oh, victims were men. <laughs> I thought Sir Ripper was only interested in women. Oh, not at all. It's probably occurred to you that the uh, women we know the Ripper sought were fairly vivid symbols. A uh, kind of living comment on the society which he detested. Oh, yes. Sir. And then just as our laws change and our society changes, so then must his victims change. With each new age, the Ripper discovers a new symbol of protest. But tell us to God. Which do you hope to find here? The Ripper or the symbol? Yes, I'm not curious about that. The Ripper. All right, boys and girls. We're trapped. Let's face it. (laughs) I told you he was serious. I know, John, but what can you consider it? Oh, Stu. I've got it. Uh, Laverne, let's have that bread knife there on the side, boy. Oh, man. Thanks. Uh, (laughs) Sir Guy has come a long way on a difficult mission, so let's give him a fair chance. I'll turn out the lights for one minute. And Sir Guy can stand here in the middle of the room with the bread knife. (laughs) Now, if uh, anyone here is the Ripper, they can either make a break for it or take the opportunity to, uh, well, eradicate the pursuer. (laughs) That's fair enough, Sir Guy. Fair enough, Lester. Uh, Laverne, some uh, suitable background music, please. Uh, Something Wagnerian, you know. Now, choose your partners for the kill, ladies and gentlemen. There'll be 60 seconds of darkness for evil to make its cosmic presence known. Unchallenged, unmolested, let the Ripper ride. A minute for death, at the end of which we'll look for the bodies. Uh, ready? (laughs) All right, silence. Now, turn out the lights. Don't anyone move. Let the affirmative forces return. 
Let there be light. Look there on the floor. It's Sir Guy. My Lord, he's been stabbed. Here, let's pick up the body no, and get it off. Look, well, I guess nobody had better touch the body. Look. What is it? I mean, well, doesn't Hollywood recommend the police in moments like this? For heaven's sake, Les. I swear, Les, I, I didn't want to bring him, but he insisted. He said he'd plotted the chart. He said he was certain the Ripper would use his knife before the night was out. I don't suppose we ought to move him, do you? Well, uh, I'll call the police. For heaven's sake, Les. Well, look, if you have any ideas what we should do now, Jen, I'll shoot. Whoever goes to get the police could just as easily make a neat getaway. Lord, Les, if he was right about the river. Uh, but I wasn't, Jen. Well, so hey, wait a minute. Look at that. Now, wait, I really don't idea. think that's really quite the kind of a joke we should have had. Uh, please, uh, uh, forgive me, Nadja, for uh, frightening you so. When you were all so innocent. Uh, what is the guy? What do you mean? Hold it! Hold it, everybody! Are you sure about our innocence, Sir Guy? Oh, yes. You see, if the Ripper were here, he would have betrayed himself when he saw me lying there. Not, not a very gentle spoof, I'm afraid. Oh, oh sure. Well, well, gentle like a ton of bricks. Really? Yeah, come on, let's get a drink. Huh? Let's get away from the Well, John, um, shall we leave? It's getting rather late. Yes, Sir Guy. Oh, you can shut your mouth now, Nadia. The game's over. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'll get your coats. Thanks. Well, goodbye, and everyone, and uh, forgive me if I gave you an unnecessary scare. Oh, they've forgotten about it already, Sir Guy. Good night, Les. Thanks. Don't mention it, John. Come around again, Sir Guy. I'd like to. Good night, Lester. Good night. I suppose you're thinking that I'm guilty of the same sort of sensational tricks as our friend the Ripper, but I want only to rid the world of a devilish thing who lives by the blood of others. As Les said, they've all forgotten it by now. Well, I guess I was wrong to seek him out as a party. You know, we're far more likely to find him out here in the darkness and the fog. Perhaps along a lonely, shadowed street such as this. Or perhaps in a neglected dead end. Like this one here. Not so dire. Please, do me one more favor. It's, it's only a hunch, but let's turn up this alley. See what it has to offer. Remember, the Ripper must make a sacrifice tonight. Well, as long as I've gone this far. Thanks, Anne boy. Yes, this is what the ripper likes. Small gaping alleyway. Hardly noticeable to the rest of the city. It'll be in a hidden corner like this where I'll capture him. And I'll turn the bloody swine over to the police. He's a mad beast, John. An ageless monster let loose on the world. There's nothing up here to die. No, just to the end of the alley, John. And we'll turn back, I promise. Look, Sir Guy, don't you think this is carrying a hobby a little too far? A hobby, John? In 1888, one of those nameless drabs the Ripper killed was my mother. What? Yes. My father spent his life searching for the Ripper. Caught up with him, too, about 1926 in Hollywood, where he was stabbed in a brawl. The police never learned who it was. But I know it was the Ripper. And I'll live till I find him. I swear I will. Let me have my gun now, John. We've left your friends, and I feel safer with my gun on there. I'll see here, Sir Guy. No, please, John, now let me carry the gun. Now let me have it, John. Please. All right. You insist. John. It's not a gun, it's a knife. I know. John. John, what are you doing? Never mind the John. Call me Jack. No, no. <gasps> Hello, Lester. Canister. I didn't get you out of bed, did I? Yes, the police picked John up this morning. The guy? Oh, he's dead, all right. Oh, it's horrible, Lester. Well, of course he's in a cell. All right, Beth, I'm going in now and talk to John. 
Insane? Of course he must be. Right, Des, I'll meet you here at the jail. My time's up now, John. I'd better be going. Just one more thing, Hannister. For some reason, I want you to understand. You see, Sir Guy was right. I did have to make an offering before the night was over. I didn't want for it to be him, Canister. But up there in that alley, I realized he was as determined as I. You know, Canister, I still wonder who at that party was astute enough to send the police after me so quickly. Lester, perhaps. Huh? The police won't tell me, but I'll find out, Canister. And if it was Lester, You'll know I found out. But what difference can it make now? Oh, the police haven't won yet, Canister. The gods won't let me down. They never have. Sir Guy was right about that, too. I am eternal. I have no aid, you know. I never shall. Well, I'll be going. I'll miss you. Bye, John. Bye, Canister. Canister. Lester. Canister, I've died ten times over. Why, Les? He saved today. The charge, you know. I still died ten times over. I suspect it was you who called the police. As long as he doesn't suspect you put me wise. Now, will you tell me how you found out about it? I was emptying the wastebasket after Comedy left last night for the party. Mm-hmm. I discovered a lot of astrological plotting in his handwriting. And that Englishman's words. Couldn't forget them. Comedy just told me the gods won't permit him to be executed. He thinks he really is Jack the Ripper. He's insane, Les. Oh, and I was afraid you'd say that. Well, what do you mean? Any doctor will tell you he is insane. I know they will. Now also tell the jury. So? So the law doesn't execute the insane. It allows them to live. You mean? Who knows, Canister? Who knows? Comedy may die for his crimes, but Jack the Ripper will live on. Oh, well, spirits are hard to kill, unless they come in a bottle. Now, for our next production, we have something much less exciting. Oh, only 17 shots, or a mob of crooks outsmarting each other for a paltry $200,000, two murderers, and Simon Templer, better known as the Saint. Follow me to the green room for a preview. Right this way. Come, come. Okay. You know, Horace, you really should have told me sooner. Told you what? That police headquarters have been moved to a Long Island mansion like this. It's quite a shock to a hard-working taxpayer like me. You better start getting used to shocks, Bob. Oh, Mr. Nathan, the judge is expecting you. Go on in. I wish you wouldn't keep spotting me with that rock, though, Horace. It, it, it tickles. This way, sir. Why? Cozy little stump. Isn't it, Horace? My name is not Horace. In here, please. Judge Stryker, Mr. Natton is back, sir. Ah, yes, yes. Come in. You might as well lock the door, Natton. Right, sir. Sit down, Mr. Templer. So you are the famous gentleman known as the Saint, are you? Sometimes my friends call me that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Templer, we are faced here with a serious matter, a very serious matter. So it was seen. So serious, in fact, that I have been obliged to adopt rather uh, extraordinary measures to deal with it. Like sending around a phony dick to pick me up? Oh, you uh, knew he was a phony? My dear fat-headed friend, you didn't really think that Horace over there could successfully impersonate an officer of the law, did you? Why, uh, I... Uh, Shall we get down to business? Very well. You have in your possession a certain uh, diary 
make any statements and uh, suggestions which I hardly need say are wholly untrue. Such as the statement that when you held a fine job in Washington, you dreamed up the high tall oil swindle and got away with it. Yes, fabrication from beginning to end. And that you and your associates now control about 90% of the black market. His lies, every one of them. Naturally. That's why you're so anxious to have them suppressed. The fact remains that their publication might seriously damage the character and uh, uh, financial standing of certain reputable members of the community. Especially including you. I... Uh, it, uh, it's for that reason and that reason alone that I am prepared to uh, ascertain what uh, value you place on this uh, volume. What's your offer? Uh, shall we say uh, $10,000? <laughs> May I ask you what you find so funny about $10,000? Oh, nothing, nothing under ordinary circumstances. But you must admit that in this case, it is a little ridiculous. And uh, what would you suggest? $200,000, Judge Stryker. What did you say? You heard me. I said $200,000. You're insane. Oh, no, I'm not. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Judge. I'm going to set up a foundation. The Simon Templar Foundation for the Rehabilitation of Wounded War Veterans. It will have a capital of $1 million. Your share will be exactly one-fifth. Do I make myself clear? Why haven't you changed your tune before you ever get out of this house? Nothing. Don't try to get your gun, Horace. See, I always carry a spare, and I'm an excellent shot. Especially, you should have remembered that I always have something on my sleeve. Now, take your gun out, very slowly, by the muzzle. Drop it. Thank you. Now, you just ignore me. That's right. And now, if you'll be good enough to unlock the door... Go on. Open it. That's a good little boy. You'll hear from me again, Templar. Oh, I'm quite certain of it. In fact, I shall expect to have your check by Saturday morning. Good night, Judge. <laughs> Yes, they call him the Robin Hood of modern crime. But even a Robin Hood is not immune when powerful interests concern themselves with arranging for the sudden death of the saint. So with these uh, gentle thoughts, this is Peter Lorry closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Until next time, good night. Sleep tight. Armed Forces Radio Service.